And welcome back to Watch Us Tonight. I am your host, Tim Masso, in Center City, Philadelphia, as you can hear right outside. Today, gotta love it. We're talking watch news and rumors, why Ulysse Snardin deserves JLC levels of respect, and we are helping a viewer pare down his collection of primarily Omega Rolex and Patek Philippe. We are given advice in real time. All of this and viewer wrist shots will feature on watches tonight. But first, the people who pay for these pixels, thewatchbox.com, the best place to buy, trade, or sell a watch. Some are more into the selling side, I'm more into the buying side. I like to buy watches and I like to go to the new arrivals. Check out the shop tab, pull it down, new arrivals, bookmark it. It's your new favorite spot on the World Wide Web. And you can join me on Instagram where you will see many of our watches in 60 second video reviews. I am doing Instagram now. I am getting better at it. I am updating daily. You can actually binge watch my 60 second reviews. It's like the YouTube, but shorter, and it's easier to hide in your cubicle at work. Finally, viewer wrist shots. You guys make the program, and boy, have you stocked me up tonight as Ramon K from Switzerland scales Mount Riggi near Lucerne with his Tudor Black Bay GMT, Used B, and his scalding Cartier Tank American. Join us from the Netherlands. Russell Russell K, watch and car aficionado from the UK with a stunning Ulysse Norden Tellarium Johann Kepler. Did I say JLC and UN belong in the same sentence? There you go. Henrik S from Hamburg watches us on weekend watches with his Henschel H2 Sport, a lovely piece from the fatherland. Welcome guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. All right, guys, join it in. Let's see who we've got. Omegatron first in the box. Edward Led of Sweden. Russell996 is joining us right there. McKinley Stevens, Jason Chan from New York City. We've got Hotsey. We've got Spilker's Compass from Zurich. We've got Matt Foster, JBO Sir from Adelaide, Australia, and Sean M. joining in from Charleston, South Carolina, where, believe it or not, my sister is an on-air reporter, Kate Masso. You might have seen her before. All right, jumping straight into our topic tonight, we have insider trading. Two rumors and one fact. Let's start with the most salacious. First, I have it on good account, the long-awaited Alango Unzona steel sports watch is on. This is a second-hand rumor, but one that is reliable and one in which I place considerable credence. It will do battle with the usual suspects from Patek, Audemars, and Vacheron. While there is no timetable for the arrival of the Longa Steel sports watch, next year seems almost inevitable, given that you can only wait so long and this is a hot trend. Plus, it's been obvious for a while that Longa needs this watch. The late April opening of SIHH 2020 gives Longa a bit more time to prepare the watch and prepare the rollout. But there's an alternative. The pre-SIHH product launches are usually in the fall. They're usually around October, November, December. But next year, SIHH is in late May, or pardon me, late April, which means that you're going to see pre-SIHH stuff coming out around January, February, which coincides with the stages of Watches and Wonders in the Miami Design District. Watches and Wonders, Two years old, at least in Miami, it's a big deal, and we're seeing more and more new watch debuts. Here's the thing. Richemont, Lanka's corporate parent, practically owns the design district. You stand in the central square in the design district, and you look at everything from JLC to Lanka to Vacheron to IWC and everything in between. All of which is to say, with a large Lanka boutique on site and the timing perfect, this makes sense as the launch venue and time frame for the Longa sports watch. Given the critical importance of this watch, I would bet that Longa prefers not to wait until the deafening roar of next year's close-coupled April-May SIHH Basel. Remember, they're, they're only about two weeks apart now, and it's going to be difficult for a smaller brand that makes about 5,000 watches a year to overcome the Rolexes, to overcome the Patek Philippe's, to overcome all of the other Richemont companies and the independents that you're going to see at SIHH. They're going to roll out this watch in February, and I think it's going to be at Watches and Wonders. To be continued. Now, what should the longest sports watch include? Here's what it should not be. It should not be a water-resistant steel version of an existing Longa watch. As cool as a swimmable Datagraph, Zeitwerk, or Longa one would be, this is a watch that needs to have its own identity, and it needs to be a strong one. It can't trade on reflected glory. It should be designed, of course, around a bracelet, first and foremost. It doesn't have to be a Genta-style integrated bracelet. 
bracelet. It can be a bracelet the way Long has done it in the past. For example, the bracelet on the Datagraph during the 2000s. But it should also have an accessory strap, and you should get that included when you buy the watch on the bracelet. It should hold the line below 42 millimeters because anything bigger than 42 in a luxury sports watch today, 2020, remember this is going to be a next year kind of watch, anything bigger than a 42 would seem gauche and dated. And we don't want that for a watch that Longa frankly needs badly. It should also be loomed and at least 100 meters water resistant. A sports watch that you can't see at night is not a sports watch. Simultaneously, an all-around sports watch, because Alanga is not going to start rolling out divers and pilots watches and technicians watches. This is going to be its one family of sports watches, so it needs to be swimmable. I never felt good about the 50 meters of the Royal Oaks. You always had to go offshore if you wanted 100 meters. Patek got it right with 120 on the Nautilus, and realistically, that should be the target. And it should be priced. And it should be priced well between twenty and twenty-five thousand dollars. That significantly undercuts the thirty thousand six hundred and twenty dollar Nautilus, but at the same time, it keeps the new Longa sports watch competitive with the Audemars and Vacheron automatics, the Royal Oak and the Overseas, that both retail for under twenty thousand dollars. So I think twenty to twenty-five thousand is the sweet spot for pricing here. Okay, jumping in right here, I see Richard Combs joining us from South Florida. He is not far from the Design District. Robert Schmidt joining in from Wisconsin. Rich Buddy, hi Tim, hi Rich, good to see you. We've got Dave Opencar. Good evening, guys. Good evening, Dave. And then we've got Robert Fletcher from San Francisco and Rick Williams. Hola, Tim. Welcome, Rick. And SoCal Watch Reviews. What's up, Tim? Love from Southern California. Southern California is my destiny. I will find myself there. And right now, I'm shopping hand-built bikes from San Diego, so the two things might come together. Okay, our second rumor of the night, and this is a big one, because I have only just started to hear, hear uh, suggestions, impressions, off-the-cuff reactions to the effect that the Patek Nautilus market is starting to soften and that this is happening in real time right now as we speak. After a two-year surge in value worthy of a two-month surge in Bitcoin value, my contacts in the industry have started noting slackening demand for the standard 5711 and suddenly improved levels of inventory, both new and pre-owned. I've heard that dealers overseas not yet in the States, but overseas suddenly have better access to new product and even a cursory search of real inventory on popular trading sites reveals a large number of watches in the hands of vendors, which means that this is actual stock. The latter phenomenon often presages the terminal phase of a watch value bubble. When speculators have watches but not customers, the bull market is circulating the drain. Now, I've been predicting this for a while, and frankly, it doesn't take a rocket science to predict that what goes up will come down, but it's the sheer extremity of the value surge of the Nautilus that makes this a compelling ongoing story. I've been predicting it for a while, but I think we're all on the same page here. Sports watch collectors who didn't want to get burned paying ridiculous markups for the Nautilus have already bought themselves a Vacheron overseas in steel, or they've sought value in depreciated used watches of recent build from brands as varied as JLC, Omega, and Blancpain. Or they've even gone for some of the still mostly available Rolex steel sports watches, like for example, the Yachtmaster, the Explorer 2, the Milgauss, the Standard Explorer 1, the Yachtmaster 2, and of course, the Air King. So there are Rolex options. If you want to get your full steel sports watch fix with Geneva watchmaking, you don't have to go Patek Philippe, and a lot of folks have realized that. So now, Here's the deal. Those who decided they needed a Patek Nautilus this very instant must understand that it is not normal to pay 60 to 70 grand for a $30,000 new watch. Hopefully, they will equate willingly the cost of instant gratification with roughly three Salmon P chases, because three $10,000 US bills is roughly the margin by which the real value of the Nautilus, sustainable in the long term, exceeds the value it's currently trading. But if anyone from that latter group has any second thoughts, this storm has not yet made landfall. So if you own a Nautilus that you bought for 70 grand, take cover, because some are going to get soaked. Jumping into the box right here, we've got some friends joining in. Mark S. from Brooklyn. We've got Karsten Lund from Denmark. And we've got KRBC from Auckland, New Zealand joining me. All right, guys. Marco is in the box. We've got Captain Zed wearing an FP Journe with rubber strap. We've got Oliver P. We've got 
Thomas Burnett and Portia Maven, a fellow auto enthusiast, and Slayer Rock Forever, a fellow thrash enthusiast. I like my audience. I got the best on YouTube. Okay, fact, no speculation here, guys. I will be at the fourth annual Dubai Watch Week. That is yours truly floating just above Bahrain and Qatar in the Persian Gulf, and I will be at Dubai from November 20th through November 24th. I am psyched about this. This is a rare chance for me to meet regionally with my Middle Eastern friends and express my gratitude for all the support you guys have given me over the last half decade dating back to the hands-only watch you want days. I'm excited to be a participant, and I will have more details shortly on my actual itinerary. I might be on some panels, I might be part of some functions, but above all, please, if you have a chance to make it, introduce yourself and talk watches with me at Dubai Watch Week in November. Okay, Gunter A asks, Tim, is there a reason why Ulysse Nardin doesn't get the respect that a Shisher LeCoult or even a Zenith seems to receive from watch collectors? The company seems to innovate constantly. It is a true manufacturer and an impressive one at that, and it builds remarkably good values in almost every product class from dive watches to tourbillon. Okay, Gunter, good question. There are three main reasons that UN does not get JLC levels of respect. First, the most fundamental. When you fall in love with a luxury watch, you normally fall in love with the way it looks. And UN designs range from weird to downright bizarre. Do you remember this monstrosity from SIHH last year? Technically unimpeachable, but that is a watch that belongs in 2008, not 2018. There's an integrity to this individualism. Nobody can accuse UN of following trends, that's for sure. But the result, and I admit this from the bottom of my heart, is intellectually appealing, but it is not always classically beautiful. Marching to your own drummer sometimes means marching alone. Second, there is a lingering perception that the last 20 years of Ulysse Nardin design, rightly or wrongly, have been targeted toward a nouveau riche Russian market. And while there certainly was a large amount of that, many of the designs were simply in the interests of the rather left field people who ran UN. Pierre Gigax, Patrick Hoffman, Ludwig Oxlin, Rolf Schneider. These were folks who would create different watches in any era. So the Russian label is both a bit of a pejorative that's undeserved, because after all, my own country gave the world 60 foot long pink Hummer stretch limos and Europe has its own excesses. But it's also not true that these watches were tailored exclusively to the Russian market. So a bit of a myth. Third, UN has been subject, and this is undeniable, to the same basic equation of overproduction and under demand that has devalued every other brand that has lost ground in a perception standpoint over the last decade and two decades. They've simply made too many watches. And for a brand that makes maybe 20 to 20,000, 20 to 25,000 watches a year, making too many watches equates to a bad read of the consumer market. It is bad for your brand when people see your watches in gray market dealers marked down or years old in the dealer case. All of which is to say, like JLC and Zenith, UN simply made too many watches. Unlike JLC and Zenith, UN does not really have that long a history. As the brand we know today, it only dates back to 1983 when Rolf Schneider came back from East Asia and revived the brand. So it doesn't have the 40s, 50s, 60s golden age behind it that something like an AP or a Patek would have to lean on during lean times. So UN is an incredible manufacturer. They make innovative constant force escapements, tourbillon watches, enamel watches at bargain prices, in-house calibers for complications and simple watches alike. They respect their own history and they innovate with complication types that no one had yet imagined. All of that being said, they deserve JLC reputation. They've got a long way to go. And now let me jump into the box and see who we've got right here. The Watch Lounge saying, I remember the Watch You Want days, responding to Eddie Landsberg, who was in the studio for our last live broadcast. Eddie, I appreciate that. I hope you're doing all right in Jersey. I see we have a stump slide saying that UN looks a lot like Invicta designs. And yeah, that's a problem. That's part of the reason UN struggles with reputation. So, viewer wrist shots. Show me some watches that we can all agree on, guys. Randy A and his Zin 156 Aviator's Chrome. Chronograph. Spies, a Lockheed U-2 reconnaissance plane. 
in the US of A. Tyler E. one-ups the watches and wings theme with his Omega Blue Side of the Moon Aventurine dial and De Havilland Otter en route to vacation. JCS is groundbound at the Willard Clock Museum in Grafton, Massachusetts with his Rolex Datejust Turnograph. And Alan L. is a man after my own heart with his Damasco DA34 from Zinn's great German tool watch rival. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Jumping into the box right here, we've got Chapman FX, we've got Tody Sanchez, good morning Tim, good morning Tody, thanks for joining in early with me. We've got Finchie, we've got Frank V, saying any advice on Blanc Pas Le Mans flyback or perpetual in 38 millimeters? I would say realistically, if you're buying a Blanc Pas Le Mans flyback chronograph perpetual in 38 millimeters, you want to get a recent service record. Because while the watchmaking is beautiful and high horology, it is also sensitive to maintenance interval and sensitive to incompetent watchmaking, all of which means there should be a recent, that is, last five years service receipt from Blancpain. And what you're going to want is to either get that service receipt or get a consideration on price so you can have the watch serviced imminently if it's not everything you expect when you pull it out of the box. That is my recommendation. It is a great watch, it is high horology, but it is a little bit more delicate than these things usually are, even in that price class. Jumping into a question from a viewer every once in a while, you guys sent, and by the way, I see Anthony Napoli joining in from Melbourne. Thank you for joining me, Anthony. Every once in a while, a viewer will send me an excruciatingly detailed inquiry by email, and normally I have to respond shorthand or, and this really makes me guilty, I don't respond at all because I've got a lot going on and I can't always advise on a huge life decision that encompasses 200 or 300 typed words. So. In this instance, Luis, I am going to answer your question on air, and you have a wonderful one. It is about how to pare down a collection that includes a lot of heavy hitters from Omega, Rolex, and Patek Philippe. In his own words, Luis asks, Hey Tim, after a journey of collecting watches and enjoying the journey of buying watches, I would like to narrow my collection to three to five pieces. This is my current collection. I would like your insights and advice of which one to keep, which might be preferable to sell and what I might acquire within the same basic budget and collection theme. I'm not into highly complicated watches and I'm not into gold watches, maybe two tones. Occasionally I would like to see a Piaget Altiplano, time only, in the collection or maybe a Rolex Explorer down the line. Here is my current collection. One, Rolex Submariner date. Two, JLC Grand Reverso, Ultra Thin, Tribute to 1931. Three, 2017 Omega Speedmaster 1957 60th Anniversary Trilogy. Four, 2014 JLC Tribute to Geophysic. Five, Rolex GMT Master II 16760 Coke Bezel. Six, Patek Philippe Nautilus Blue Dial 5711-1A010. Seven, 2018 Rolex Submariner Hulk. 8. Patek Philippe Aquanaut 5167A Steel. 9. Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Ultraman. And 10. Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter Chrome Ceramic Dial. All right, these are all good watches. Let me just tell you that there is no right watch to keep in this collection because most people would be proud to own all of them and I should mention you've got a lot of watches that many people aspire to own. You're already there. So reduce carefully. That said, here are the keepers and the casualties. 2010 Submariner date. This is a core Rolex model, but it's not the standard Submariner Sans date. This is a Submariner date, so this isn't as core as core can get within the Rolex catalog. It's an appealing watch, but it's also redundant in your collection since you also own the Hulk with identical size, functions, capability, and in my opinion at least, a bit more charm and charisma. Unless you have personal aesthetic doubts about making the big green sub your only sub, this standard black date sub should be the sub that you sell. Okay, JLC Grand Reverso Ultra Thin with two Faliano straps. I recommend you keep this one. If you own just one JLC, 
it should be a Reverso. With the Rolex and Omega Divers already in your collection, there's no need to settle for a swimmable JLC Polaris or Geophysic model here. So I would say among dress watches, this one is a prince. And with the robustly loomed dial, this is an easy watch to see at night. It's a bit more versatile than most other dress watches. So it's got that going for it. And more than just another historic tribute watch, this model, which properly speaking was the 80th anniversary Reverso, is considered a long-term collectible and a classic in its own right. All of which is to say, with two JLCs in your collection, this is the one that stays. Unless you plan to upgrade your 2011 Grand Reverso Tribute to 1931 with the ravishing 2012 Reverso Rouge, keep this Reverso in your collection. Now, Rolex Daytona stainless steel ceramic, the 116500LN, this is a very hot watch. You have this and a 5711 in the same collection. If you bought this one new or used for even close to retail, keep this watch. Buying one of these used for over 20,000 right now is about as shaky a proposition long term as paying for a Nautilus above $60,000. This said, the Daytona is a legend, and if you paid sane money for this watch, not only is it a good value retention proposition, but the Daytona Steel Ceramic gives you one of the big three Rolex sports watches. Along with your Hulk, you now have a Daytona. Keep them both. They belong in a themed collection, and you've got that theme going. Given the strength of pre-ceramic 2000 to 2015 in-house Daytonas, so basically the watch that came just before, that is still a hot watch that sells for a lot of money. So I think this steel ceramic will remain a hot watch and a secure investment if you paid retail or close, even if next year we get the anticipated next generation Rolex Daytona. So I think your money is safe here and I recommend you keep this watch. Okay, the 2017 Omega Speedmaster 1957 60th anniversary, part of the trilogy, along with the Railmaster and the Seamaster back in 2017. I'd sell this one, honestly. For one, the watch is attractive, but it takes no chances, which means it won't be as memorable as some watches that perhaps are less literal re-editions. It's pleasant and true to history, but it doesn't manage to reanimate the excitement of a vintage original. It's neither a real vintage Omega, nor a modern day true NASA issued Omega Moonwatch. It's a weird and undesirable middle ground between those. Unless you own one of the 557 examples with matched serial numbers, remember there were 557 matched serial number Speedmaster, Seamaster, and Railmaster pieces. Those are a different grade of store of value and investment. If you have that and the other two watches, then hang on to this 1957. If it's a standalone, let it go. Given the more imaginative, exclusive, and memorable Ultraman Moon Watch that is also in your collection, let the 57 trilogy go. It seems superfluous. All right, I can see Tim Masso's sunglasses in the box. We've got Tom S. We've got a Monk 93. We've got Anon, Anonymous, I guess. We've got Eh Eh. And we've got Lord Nantucket, who's asking, what happened to TGV on the channel? TGV is on his own channel. The Urban Gentry, now powered by Watchbox. You can check out his features over there. For the most part, there's only going to be occasional crossover. I think we've got a strong brand. He's got a strong brand. And we're going to build both of them. Okay, jumping into the new JLC. Tribute to Geophysic. This is another watch you've got in the collection. 800 pieces from 2014. I would sell this one unless you simply adore the Tribute to Geophysic. It's a good size. At 38.5, it's a rare water-resistant 100-meter JLC dress watch, and it has more to love than the Speedmaster 60th anniversary, but with the Reverso already in your watch box and a stated desire to pare down your collection to three to five pieces, you can let this one go. While I like the tribute to Geophysic, and it's an impressive chronometer, highly water-resistant and anti-magnetic with a Faraday cage inside, it is not even the most interesting modern Geophysic. That title goes to the multi-talented 40 1.8 millimeter geophysic universal time deadbeat second with a lacquered gradient dial with a Lampert projection that is the coolest geophysic you can buy short of the flying tourbillon now keep it and If you love it keep it But if there's any room to downsize and remove one JLC 
No tribute to Geophysic. Okay, Rolex GMT Master Coke 16760. For those of you just joining, we have a collector, Luis, who has asked me to help pair his rather impressive collection of steel sports watches. We are cutting and keeping, and now we're up to his Sophia Loren Fat Lady First Generation GMT Master II. All right, this is a keeper. Do not sell this watch unless your example is seriously ragged and in awful condition, because not only is this a vintage collectible, but this is a land mark Rolex. This was the first true dual time GMT Master, the first GMT Master 2 of any kind, and it was the first Coke bezel. Second, this is a rare watch compared to everything else that you've introduced in your collection. There are very few of these in great condition because it had a narrow production window between 1983 and 1988. So you take the examples that are still serviceable and in good shape. Now you're talking perhaps even fewer examples than there are 5711s and Aquanauts floating around. Third, this Coke bezel GMT gives you all three of the core Rolex sports watches with a GMT, a Daytona, and a sub Hulk, I wouldn't part the three amigos, keep them together. And fourth, while I can see your sub and your Daytona taking a little bit of a value dip, as markets correct and global economies ebb, that same effect of waning value has less purchase on the vintage market, where values tend to be a little bit more stable. So purely on that basis, this vintage classic is unlikely to face the same downward pressure that applies to watches of recent build. Your Patek Nautilus blue dial, stainless steel, 5711. What to do with this one? My advice, and it's an easy one, is as with your Daytona, if you paid anywhere near retail price for this watch, keep it. It's one of the hobby's all-time great models, among the most versatile watches you can buy, and a certifiable heirloom for your kids or grandkids. Only if you bought this at a recent secondary market markup, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars, should you let it go now. And that would only be because you could buy it later for less money. If you've already got it and you paid sane money, keep it. The Rolex Hulk. Okay, the Hulk. What is there to say about the Hulk other than this is the Submariner with a date to own? Unless we're talking some sort of big crown vintage piece or a one-off prototype, the green Submariner is the sub with a date in stainless steel to own. This is an easy one. It's historically significant as the first full green sub. It has a lot of charm unique to that gloss serochrome bezel and the sunburst metallic of the green gold dial. And if your steel sub isn't gonna be a no date, Boom, that. Patek Philippe Aquanaut, steel on a strap, 5167A. Feel free to sell this one. You don't need this watch. You've already got the Nautilus, which is a more thoroughly handcrafted, more historically significant, and more graceful watch with its integrated bracelet. If you really need a Patek sports watch on a strap, just get the accessory strap. There's a rubber accessory strap or leather, your choice, that you can get for the Nautilus. You can change the look, you can have an Aquanaut aesthetic, and you can keep the more desirable of the two Patek sports watches that you already have. Core Patek Philippe to me, the essential Patek Philippe, means a Nautilus, a Calatrava, a pocket watch, or a high complication. The Aquanaut is not part of the Pantheon. Desirable, but less so than what you already have with the Nautilus, so sell this one. Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch Ultraman. Now you have an Ultraman, and you have the 60th anniversary 1957 trilogy. You're gonna want to keep this one. First, the Speedy Tuesday 2 limited edition of 2012 pieces is less common than your trilogy 1957, which is 3,557 pieces. So, on the basis of rarity, advantage Ultraman. But second, the boxed set, the imagination invested in the dial, the tack, the case, and the strap, the collection of accessories that comes with this watch renders it one of the most memorable Speedmaster limited editions, and it is difficult to break out from the ranks in a crowd that large. When you can say that you've got a Speedmaster limited edition that rises above the others, you've got a watch that could be the next Silver Snoopy. It's rare for an Omega limited edition to get as much attention and be as different from standard issue as this one is. Third, as a true 42 millimeter beveled case Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch, all of the glory and allure 
of the NASA-issued Omega Moon Watch accrues to this one as well. That is not something you can say of the 1957 trilogy. And fourth, this is a nostalgic watch, true. It recalls the 1967 reference 145012, the one that appeared in the Ultraman series. I didn't see it, and I know you didn't either. So we're just reading whatever was written by Omega in the press launch for this. That said, this is not a copy of that, and I have held both in my hand so I know the difference. This is actually more fun than the original. And unlike the 1957 trilogy, which is a slavish reproduction that doesn't stand on its own four lugs as an obvious future classic, this does have that quality of being a classic in its own right, not basking in reflected glory, but generating its own glow. The other Omega in your collection, though, whew, I don't know what to say. The Seamaster Diver 300 meter anniversary. This is the 25th anniversary watch from last year, which is objectively just an awesome watch. You have the gray chrome ceramic dial, and this is a watch that I love on its own terms, but it has no role in your collection. Given your target of three to five watches when all is said and done, hard decisions meet, need to be made, and good watches need to be shown the door. And this one is the unfortunate odd man out when the music stops, this one doesn't have a chair. Outside of this context, objectively, the Diver 300 meter is a better and more capable watch and a superior value relative to the Rolex Hulk that I told you to keep. So it's better than this Rolex, and yet I'm telling you to divest. Why? Because you've already got your core Omega. The Seamaster is not part of the Pantheon the way the Moonwatch and the Sub and the Daytona and the GMT are, so let this one go. You can buy it later pre-owned for a song if you really need it back. Within the scope collection, well, you already have the essential Omega Moon watch in the Ultraman. Stick with the Ultraman. Okay, jumping into the box right here. Guys, thank you for joining me. I can see we've got Bud to stud. We've got Richard K. ID guy joining in. We've got Jean-Claude Beaver of the Toothy Grin. And then right here, we've got Bark and Jack saying, I can't stand that watch. Ugliest fudge. The Diver 300 meter? You might be the only person who hates the watch. Some people are ambivalent, but most folks like that model. And then right here, we've got Jam Dan asking, when is Omega going to update the day date? Well, the con I assume we're talking about either the Aquaterra day date or the Constellation day date. I would say we see a new day date when we see a new constellation. So maybe this year or the next. And by the way, uh, Yam, if I've mispronounced your name, Yam Don. Let me try to get it right right there and make amends. All right, so where does this leave us with Luis's collection? It leaves us with the Hulk, the Rolex GMT, the the Coke GMT, the Daytona, the Nautilus, the Ultraman, and the Reverso, of course. That's six watches, not three to five. So the job's not done. Here's where you have to be a bit more circumspect. Pair your collection in two steps. Go down to those six essential pieces, and then, after a few months with this rotation, you'll know which watch or watches are the odd men out, because those will be the watches that you don't wear as much. When a watch is not getting wrist time, that is a sign, an emotional sign, that it's time to let that one go, recoup the funds, and maybe buy something else. Also, that'll be the time to decide whether, and you mentioned an Explorer and a Piaget, but that'll be the time to decide whether your collection deserves an Explorer of some kind, whether an Explorer 1 or an Explorer 2, your choice, or if you want to get into Piaget with something like the 910P Ultimate, which is an extraordinary dial side peripheral rotor skeleton that is time only, as you asked originally, that will be the time to expand the collection. But do not expand the collection until you get it down to that three to five. Now, we also have a few of your own watches here. Luis aside, and I admit he dominated and monopolized the discussion. Viewer wrist shots, we start with Chris L. Chris, all right. Flying at sea level on English roads with his Xeno Diver, Mazda MX-5, and some wicked ink. The other Tim M keeps cool with the Rolex Explorer 2 Polo in Orlando, Florida, the theme park capital of the world here in the United States. Matt F weathers the dog days of summer with his Oris Divers 65. And Abdul R ends another day and another show with his Rolex Explorer 2 on the water at sunset in Egypt. Guys, we're not quite done with the show because this is the live question and answer interactive segment. Abdul, if you're in there tonight, thank you for your constant participation and superb wrist shots. He is my MVP of the wrist shot segment. 
Remember, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com if you want to see your watches on this box. Let's jump into the box right here. We have a question. What is your coffee brand preference? Chock full of nuts is the heavenly coffee, but then again, I'm a New Yorker and specifically I am from Long Island, so I would say that. It's a family favorite. Right here we have a question about the Piaget Octo Finissimo, and I have to say I recommend this watch wholeheartedly. There are only two instances in which I would not recommend the Octo Finissimo. One, you're hard on your watches. It is rather lightly built, minimally water resistant and being a very thin timepiece of both case and movement. If you tend to shock, water down, or otherwise abuse your watch, even if you work around high powered electronics, this is not your watch. If you're looking for a replacement for some overrated Genta design like a Royal Oak or Nautilus, go for it. For 10 grand used, you can save the money and buy a sports watch to wear when you have to get wet and wild. I recommend the Octo Finissimo. It does not take that big a hit pre-owned. Precious metal, you're on your own. But if you buy it in steel, very attractive, or titanium, it's only going to lose about one to $2,000 out of a price between roughly eleven and a half to 12000 And if you're looking at the new GMT chronograph, frankly, it has no equivalent. So that is a unique watch that I recommend over any ultra-thin chronograph GMT because it just doesn't have any competition. Let's see right here. We have, I'd be curious to see if waiting for the Explorer would be worth it. We've got Atra watches. Tim, don't you think the new 32XX movements would be on their way at the next Basel? It does seem like at some point the three-day movement is going to find its way to all of the watches. For now, for example, you don't get it in the Milgauss, you don't get it in the Oyster Perpetuals, you don't get it in the Explorer 1, you don't get it in the Submariner, and that seems like a great oversight, but if I had to predict, I would say Rolex is doing two things. One, it's trying to hold the line on price for those basic watches like the Oyster Perpetual, the Air King, and undoubtedly the Explorer 1. Particularly with the Oyster Perpetuals, Rolex is trying to keep its entry level below six or $7,000, and it's doing so successfully. Now, with some of the more expensive watches in that catalog, like, for example, the Submariner or the Milgauss, I think what Rolex is doing is it's ramping up its ability to produce these watches. It's not like they just increased the power reserve. If you've looked, for example, at the Chronergy Escapement, it is a very complicated system, and some of those parts are made by computer controlled chemical etching, all of which is to say there is a learning curve even for Rolex, which is why I think Rolex will be slow to create three-day power reserve Air Kings, Oyster Perpetuals, Submariners, and Milgauss. I think it makes sense that you saw this movement, the three-day rollout in day dates, in GMTs, in Daytonas, in date just 41s and sea dwellers. So expect a year or two before the entry level gets the three day calibers. It's something even Rolex has to take at a measured pace. Right here, we've got legit question to Watchbox Studios from Tom S. Okay, my wife is getting me a watch for my 30th later this year, have a $5,000 limit, want a Rolex, what would you recommend? For five grand and a Rolex, I would say realistically, try to get your hands on a turnograph. You might have to search around a little bit, but I think the most interesting Rolex watches you can buy for around five grand are the famed Thunderbirds, the rotating bezel Datejust, a watch that is occasionally available with a roulette date wheel. And if you look around, you're gonna find these. They are handsome, they are uncommon, they are historically important as a Rolex watch that was actually issued by a United States Armed Service branch to its service members back Back in the 50s, and the Turno is the coolest date just. So I would aim for that. Otherwise, if you want to be a little bit unconventional, the Oyster Quartz date just is a legend. And if you can buy one from the end of the line, figure 2000, 2001, you will have a watch that is part of a series made in 25,000 copies, including the date date. Oyster Quartzes, over a quarter century, one of the rarest and most important modern Rolex watches, and the clearest example of Gerald Genta's influence on Rolex Extant. So I would recommend that. I would also recommend looking at some of the Oyster Perpetuals with the more interesting dials. Now, for a lot of folks, last year with the white and the black dials, it was just more acceptable as a mainstream watch. 
I like the 2015 dials, the olive, the grape, the blue. Those are cool to me, and that's where I would be looking if I'm spending five grand on a Rolex. So that's my advice for Tom S. Let me see, there was a question, something, something, Tim 2008. Logan Hall saying he has the blue 300 meter ceramic Seamaster wave dial and he absolutely loves it. I can definitely embrace that. And then we have a question from James B. Did that Tiffany Explorer 2 make it to the website? Yes, we still have that Tiffany Dial Explorer 2 Tritium if you're interested in it. And then right here, bu -bu -bu bump. It's so hard because the chat box is flying along and I want to answer every, every question you guys ask. Okay, Jim B asking, Tim Masso pronouncing anything over 42 millimeters dated and belonging in 2008. Maybe if I have the wrist of a nine-year-old girl like you, Tim Masso. I'm not commenting personally. I'm just saying this is the market trend. The era of the 48 millimeter Hublot and the 44 millimeter Royal Oak Offshore is over. The era of the 45 millimeter Cartier dress watch is over. The question isn't whether a guy with a bigger, burlier wrist needs a big watch. The question is whether a guy with a wrist my size is going to try to pull it off as fashion, and that's where the change has occurred. I agree, there should be big watches for big guys, but every watch doesn't have to be designed with Arnold, Stallone, or Shaq in mind, and that's the difference between now and the 2000s. Jumping down into the box right here, Matt Foster, been talking to a Crivia ADs. Okay, the Chronomet Contemporane is all sold out, AK06, there are two movements left, Chrono sold out, 100 plus watch wait list for the next Chronomet Contemporane, not including Torbs, need to get on board soon. Recep Recepi and his brother Zebdet are the most interesting people to come along in the independent watchmaking scene, probably since the likes of... I would say the likes of Keaton Myrick, David Kando, and maybe Daniel Nebel. Interesting because he was a Patek Philippe intern in his teens, and he's not a native of Switzerland, and yet he is making the most beautifully designed, executed, and thoughtfully detailed watches you can buy within the city or canton of Geneva right now. There were reports that people were coming to SIHH, bringing their entire family to meet Recep Recepi to lobby for a spot on his wait list to show you, look, we're all in it together and we're really into what you're doing. The problem? A really long wait list. The good news? There are guys like those folks I just named who are available to make your watch bespoke right now. No wait list. Okay. Jean-Claude Beaver, Tim, Jepec, what is the deal? Jepec is an interesting story. It is a revived brand named after the original business partner and fellow Pole of Patek Philippe founder Antoine Norbert de Patek. He continued with Adrian Philippe in the 1840s. Jepec went off and continued his own manufacture. Well, in the last five years, Jepec, initially aided by crowdfunding, has been restarted, and the watches are exceptional. Working with a combination of Vauche Manufacture and Chronode, they have created models that are handsome, often bespoke, a little bit left field in design, but real world durable, and I would even say distinctive of their brand style. And it it's hard to say that a brand style has been achieved at a company that makes a few dozen watches per model per year and has only been around since about 2013. And that's only in concept. They've been around since 2013. So I think the Kedeberg is a gorgeous watch. I would get it with the green rainforest guilloche dial. They're working with the best suppliers in the business. For the green guilloche, they're working, for example, with Metalem. They also have suppliers for enamel. The folks who run the brand are stand-up individuals. And I can tell you that they are friendly, fun, enthusiasts and collectors in their own right. And the price for what they make in honest base metals is right. I would say proceed without caution. This is a definite buy. And I would also say it's buying with a view towards later owning a watch of an esteemed modern independent manufacturer. Okay, a question, another question about TGV. Uh, TGV is still around. He's over on the Urban Gentry. He's still on his platform, and that's the thing. We have three platforms. We have Watchbox Reviews, which is all me. We have the Urban Gentry, which is all him. And then we have Watchbox Studios, which is a mix of all of the above, plus corporate videos, plus interviews, collectors, and of course, when we've got anything to announce about the company, you'll see it right here. And then right here, 
Tim, what happened to the Breguet 7727? Seems to have come out with a flash of brilliance and then nothing. Now, if you guys recall, this was the 72,000 vibration per hour floating magnetic pivot Agidor winner back in 2014. I believe it was 2014. This was the grand prize at watchmaking, a super high rate Breguet silicon heavy chronometer. What happened to it? Everyone was talking about it and then it disappeared within the morass of the Breguet brand. A great watch that's poorly marketed inside a brand that's poorly marketed is guaranteed to be buried under inevitability, which means that brands that are better at making their case, and that includes everyone from Audemars Piguet to FP Journ Hell to Tudor, are going to get all the attention and even a superior product made by a backbench brand and I hate to say that's what Breguet has become, but a superior product made by a backbench brand is gonna disappear. All of which is to say the 7727 deserves your attention. The Classique Chronometry High Rate is one of the coolest used watches you can buy. And as long as folks are underrating the Breguet brand, I will be able to say that about just about every watch Breguet makes. All right, a question from Patrick. Tim, is a hot dog a sandwich? Of course it's a sandwich. You're talking about a hot dog enthusiast right here. I practically lived at 7-Eleven during all my bike rides on Long Island. No other place can you dress a dog for less money. And that's coming from a locality that has Nathan's. So I've got 7-Eleven, I've got Nathan's, I've got my pick with Costco hot dogs, quarter pound plus, dressed any way you like. You better believe, as a Yankee fan who has spent a small fortune on food at the stadium, I am a hot dog fan. I believe it's a sandwich and it's part of the Pantheon alongside Panini's sub and burgers. No argument there. All right, bump, bump, bump. How does everyone feel about Omega from Andres Morales? Omega is a great brand to buy used. I hate to say that, but they overproduce. Uh, the company, frankly, is trying to cut down on gray market in Europe, South America, and the Middle East. And reportedly, the Swatch Group has something approaching one years worth of surplus in inventory sitting in BN right now. Much of that is Omega. I have no idea what they're going to do with all that inventory, but I can tell you this, so much is already out of the gate. So many horses are already out of the barn that Omega is one of the most technically advanced and accomplished brands you can buy. They have a great history and real pedigree. The watches will be serviceable forever by a super major in the industry, but I would not pay retail for an Omega a watch when so many are available lightly used. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining in. You made this show awesome. I loved the interaction. Let me know in the box below which watches you think Luis should sell and maybe keep. Subscribe. Let me know what I can do to improve. Let me know what worked. Check me out at Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Do it right now. Thanks to you. Thanks to my crew. Time out. Tim out. Thanks for logging on and I'll see you in Dubai.